All right, so one thing that's just like, I guess a little tricky about time complexity and figuring out how long it takes to run operations is sometimes those operations are a bit hidden. So for example, here you can see we have a list of elements, right? We have five elements. And then we ask, okay, is the number six in these five elements, right? So, you know, I guess naively, right? It looks like just one step but really you have to think about, well, how is Python probably doing this, right? And the way it's doing it is going one by one, right? Through each element in the list and saying, does, you know, our target, is that one of these elements, right? So it's a loop, okay? So how many steps is, it, is there, is it involved? We could say, okay, well, there's five elements here. So for each of these elements, we have to go through, see does that does this element equal the target, and then if it does, return true, otherwise return false. Um, meaning if none of them, uh, you can see if we get through the whole uh, loop and we never return true, then at the end we return false. So how many steps is it? It feels like, you know, for each element, we have to perform this check, so that's five steps, and then for the one that finally, this guy, where we finally get to a true, there's that last step. So it's, uh, I think he, in my exam, so anyway, it's, it's n plus one, right? It's the number of elements, five in this case, plus one more step of, I guess, returning true, okay? Or if we get to the end and there's nothing, then returning false. So one thing just to note off the bat, when you're thinking about like the cost of something uh, from like a, how long does it take, we normally we express that in terms of the size of the data set, right? Because typically, and this isn't always the case, but typically, right, like the larger our data set, the more costly an operation is, okay? So, so that's not really a function of like, you know, our procedure that's, you know, we want to see how our procedure is doing with respect to any kind of size data set. And so to do that, we can express in terms of n, right? So the cost is n plus one uh, for here. And, you know, we just kind of counted one by one. All right, so in your time complexity, if we kind of Google it, and we'll, we'll start to under, you know break down these terms. We say the time complexity of an algorithm, right, a procedure, quantifies the amount of time taken to, by, the, by that procedure to run as a function of the length of the string, right? That's the first thing we talked about uh, with respect to the length of the input, right? The length of the string representing the input. The time complexity of an algorithm is commonly expressed in a big O notation. So we'll talk about that next, or like maybe in the next lesson, which excludes coefficients in lower order terms, whatever that last sentence means. So the first thing is, right, we're expressing it in terms of n, where n is the length of the input. Note, notice what we did, by the way, is, um, you know, we're saying, well, it took us n plus one steps, but like that's not totally, like it doesn't always take n plus one steps because what if the number six comes first, right? If the number six comes first, then we say, okay, go through each element. If the element equals the target in the first step it does, right? And then we're done. So like, what not that, that should be two steps, right? Because we just go through the first, if the element equals the target, that's one, step one. Step two is return true. So the question is like, why did we say it's n, you know, this is less than the length of the input. So why do we say it's n plus one? Um, well, when you're, cat, when you're, you know, doing time complexity and big O, um, you always choose the worst case scenario. Okay, so why do we always choose the worst case scenario? With the best case scenario, we never worry about how long it takes because, you know, if we if we kind of can look at the first uh, input and figure out if that's, and we're done, right? If we're just done after one input, then we don't have a problem. We don't have to worry about how long something takes uh, because computers are fast as it is and taking like one step or even if this took a hundred steps, it's not a big deal. We care like when, in the worst case scenario, 
uh, or when things are starting to go wrong, how long something takes, not when things are going well, really, because that's not a problem we need to solve for. So the best case is like good, so we don't need to we, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, the average case it seems like more practical in terms of we should see how long things take on average and maybe optimize for that. So in other words, by that I mean maybe we have a list of um, like it's like what what number typically shows up here, you know, and in what order. So maybe we could you know we have users filling out different like choices and and so we should see on average what are the choices look like and then optimize based off of that. Right, based on like the data that we're seeing. Typically, like that's not how we perform the calculation. The reason why is because it takes gathering the data, right? And maybe we don't have users for application yet, right? We're building it and then we're going to launch it, right? Like it's not obvious or it's not always, always gonna be the case that we're going to have that data underneath. And the nice thing about, you know, assuming the worst case is well, we can just we can just assume that we don't need any outside data, and we can say, okay, what's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is that the element I'm looking for shows up last, right? That's what's going to take the longest. So, when thinking about the worst case scenario, it's basically saying, what if someone you know was trying to order your data such that uh, they're trying to make your algorithm or uh, the amount of time it takes as long as possible. Right, and the way to order the data would be to place the target in this case, right? Is to place the target last, right? So that's the worst case scenario, and we can always assume that. We can always kind of figure out what that worst case scenario is without looking at any data, and it's going to cause us problems. So we want to optimize for it. All right. So those are kind of the first things. Is just one, we're expressing uh, the cost of something, how long something takes in terms of n, and then two, we are assuming the worst case scenario, and then we'll move on from there. But any questions about those two things, or why? So, Jim, this big O is, is a terminology which, which for the uh, time complexity? Yes, it's like there are actually different ways. I think there's like I forget the other ones, like, but there are other there are other ways of calculating the cost of something. I think actually there is a name for, for instance, for calculating the average case. Like it's like it's some other Greek letter, but generally that's not asked for. That's not really what we'll cover. What we have to worry about. Uh, big O is one way of calculating the time complexity, and we'll talk about it. It gets into this last sentence, which is excluding coefficients and lower order terms. So that's the next thing. We'll talk about. So this is like, as you'll kind of see, like Big O use, is, uses is a calculation, a way, a formula or uh, of figuring out how, of expressing how costly something is. And the first step, we got through kind of half the steps. First is, okay, express it in terms of the size of the input. And two, with Big O, we always consider the worst case scenario. So if someone asks big, what is big O? So do you, do you explain them about this algorithm, time complexity algorithm, or only only ones? How do you answer that? What is yeah, let's o? let's let's finish. You can say let, let's finish the lesson, and then I think you'll have an answer. Let's get to okay. it. Uh, real quick, I missed why. Why is it plus one? Oh, okay. Yeah, if you just look at the number of steps, it's like. Okay, we assume six is last, right? Because we're choosing the worst case scenario. So it's so how many times do we check? You know, six. Uh, so it's the length of the input for every input. We perform this check, and then finally we find a success. We find a match, and we get that plus one right here. Return true. So how many operations? You know, one for each input, and then. Once we get to the number six, we get hit this line, and then we hit the next line. Okay. All right, the next thing. So the next thing is we only, you know, it kind of, it's almost goes in, it's like the same reasoning behind why we always care about the worst case scenario. 
we also only really care about uh, how costly something is asymptotically, meaning as n becomes really large, as the length of our input becomes really large. Why? Because it doesn't matter what procedure we choose when we have six inputs, we're going to be fast. We're going to, it's going to take less than a second, like probably less, less than a tenth of a second. But if this turns into be, you know, a thousand, ten thousand, then the way that we actually perform a procedure can become costly. So when we're considering big O, uh, and now we're starting to get into that, we're saying what is the big O of a function, of a procedure? This is going to be as the length of our input approaches infinity uh, or just like becomes quite big. So w let's do another example. Let's say we have some numbers one, two, and three. So again, we'll choose a pretty small input, but we wanna multiply every number by every other number on the list. So you can see I'm doing this, right? One and one, and in, in including itself. One and two, one and three. Then we go to the next number. Two and one, two and two, two and three, three and one. So how do we, how do we perform that? Right, this would be with a nested loop, okay? Uh, so we have this list, we're going through every element in the list, and then for every element, we're going through each element again. So for numbers one, two, and three, go through numbers one, two, and three and multiply, right? And then I'm kind of displaying the cost of this, right? I'm printing out each step is, there's nine different steps. And what is the point of this? Like, why are we doing this? Because just to show you what that this is a pretty costly function. Why? If we turn the, if we add one more input, right? So this now we go from having three digits to now having four, right? All of a sudden we get up to 16. If we have, you know, eight, uh, eight as our input size, then all of a sudden it's 64, right? You guys, we've all lived through a pandemic. So we know that like exponential growth is really bad. So you can see once we get to 10,000, right? This gets to what, 100 million? 100 million. So that's, their, that's our all products function. The thing, this multiply each number by every other number. That first function we saw, the is in function, how many steps are involved with that? 10,000, right? So, cause we just go through every number once, not go through for every number, go through every number. So what is the cost of this? Um, the cost of this, or the number of steps that we're taking is really n squared, okay? Uh, here, right, 10,000 times by 10,000. Here, here what we're doing is n. But like as Sonia kind of points out, well it's really n plus one, right? This is in is really, well, n plus one. But kind of what I'm, what you're starting to see is the plus one is so insignificant when our numbers gets get large, like going from 10,000 to 10,001 is so insignificant that we don't care about like that plus one. And in fact, when you're considering big O, we only care about the largest term. Okay, and I, I, we'll, we'll go into it like how to calculate terms, but if you see this function, 5n cubed plus n squared plus 100n, right? This is just like a, a function, and right, we said that our, our first uh, is in function costs n plus 1, and our second uh, multiply all terms costs something like n squared. You know, there it is possible to write functions that cost like this amount. So if you have these just to get some uh, nomenclature down. Every time you see a plus sign, this is a new term. So this is the first term, this is the second term in a function, this is the third term in a function. When you're calculating or expressing the time complexity in terms of big O, you only care about the term with the largest exponent. Why do you only care about the term with the largest exponent? Well, you can see that I set n equal to 1,000 here, and then I did n cubed, n squared, n log of n, and then just n itself, I guess in this case would be like a thousand. This number, right, just to show you, let's now add these all up. This number right here dominates all the others, okay? So this is like our hundred million or a billion maybe even. And then this guy, our n squared, only shows up in this third digit. So the impact 
of just even a slight, what seems like maybe a slightly higher order term, when n gets large, has such a significant impact that we do not have to worry about n squared or n or any of the lower order terms. You only have to worry about the term with the largest uh, with the largest exponent. Okay, so we'll show you how to calculate. Like we could calculate, you know. Uh, each of these as we look through a function. But when doing so, you only care about the number with the highest exponent. Another thing you do not care about are what's called coefficients. What's a coefficient? Coefficient is the multiplier, the number that multiplies uh, our term. So for example, if we go from 100 billion, or whatever it is, to 500 billion, uh, I have five to do five times. We won't, I know it seems like it's getting bigger, it, it's not getting bigger enough. We, we don't care about the coefficients when you're calculating big O. You especially obviously wouldn't care about it with lower order terms. Um, you can see again, it doesn't really move the dial for us. Even with the largest term, you, don't, you do not care about the coefficient. So when you're expressing big O, if you say this is the cost of the function, is 5n cubed plus n squared plus 100n, what is big O? of the function, it's just n cubed, okay? I, I'm not making the right, it, because the impact is so small as a way to just express really the meat or like the, you know, the main point as to what's going on and, and you know, what really is the cost here. It, the time complexity, the big O of a function is just expressed in terms of the higher, the highest order term and ignoring any coefficients. And you can see that again, now if we reread this definition. In computer science, the time complexity of an algorithm quantifies the amount of time taken by an algorithm to run as a function of the length of the string. Right, that was their first lesson, representing the input. So expressed in terms of n. Then we talked about we're always considered the worst case scenario. And then finally we get to this last sentence. The time complexity is commonly expressed using big O notation, which excludes coefficients, right? Those are the five times by, right? The multipliers and the lower order terms. That was like the n squared n log of n. Each of these are lower order terms. This should be a plus here. Each of these are lower order terms. All we care about is the highest order term and we exclude the coefficient, okay? So this whole thing reduces down to n cubed. Cool? What I want to do is talk about how do we calculate, um, the like look at a function and calculate the big O of it. Because it's not that complicated. What you want to look at is the, is the nested loops. That's really where you run into issues. So for example, we saw this above, right, with our multiply and input by each of the others. We go through every, each element in the list, and for each element in the list, go through every other element in the list, right? Or, right, this is n squared. So you can see that we can just have a print function. We pass through three and input a three. If we count these up, um, I guess each, we'll find 18 steps, I believe, right? Because for everything here, for every, this is going through this three times, and then for each of these three, we're going through three more, so that gives us to nine, right? Three times by three is nine, and then we're doing, uh, and then for each of these nine steps, we're having two print statements. So this whole thing is multiplied by two. So what is this kind of, equal, well this thing is 2 times by n squared, right? Because for each element here, we're going through that same list of elements. So this is for, you know, this is n squared. And then there's two steps. So this gives us 2 times by n squared, which reduces down to n squared, right? Because we do not care about the coefficient when we're calculating big O. So as you'll see, we'll, we'll give some other examples. You only care about the nested loops when you're calculating a big O. So let's give another example. What it, what's the cost here? 
n cubed, right? Because we have three, we are nested three levels deep in this case. So if we have three elements that we pass through, we should see 27 really for each one we're printing out twice. So it'll be two times n uh, to the third, right? Which reduces down to just n cubed. So, you know, you can always try this with like some prints. But if you have, you know, if we just have two elements, this would be 16 steps. Um, two, four, six, eight, eh, 10, 12, I guess I'm two. Oh, I guess I'm only printing. I'm all, oh, if I move this up one, it'll probably be 16. But this is going to be still, this is just going to be n cubed uh, steps. So for each element here, we're going through, uh, we're going through three times down here. One thing to like be careful about is what what's what's the cost of this? A lot of people would like lots of times people think that this is n squared, but it's not. All right. So let's give an let's show an example here. So we'll do elements. We'll do two loops and let's just print out, let's have a list that has two numbers in it. And you see this, we have four. The output here is four. Let's go a little bit bigger just to emphasize this. The output here is gonna be six. So notice that here we're not getting an output of eight, which is what we would have if we had n squared, two to the third is two times by two times by two, which is eight. Here, we're getting an output of two, three times by, uh, I should say three times by two. And why are we getting that? Because this is not a nested loop. So the cost of this is to go through every element just one time, and then a separately go through every element just one time. So really what we're doing is we're doing two times by n, go through every element one time, so three steps, plus go through every element one time, so three more steps. So you can see that when the loops are not nested, this gives us 2n, which reduces down to just be n. All right, so the, this is very different than something like this. Right, this now is a nested loop, and now if we try to print this out, this would be eight steps, I believe. Right, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. Oh, sorry, nine steps because our input is uh, is three. So you can see this now is n squared. You see that here we have a nested loop, and because of that, our output is going to be n squared, and in this case, we have an input of 3 squared gives us 9. Okay. So let's just do another one, right? If I do this for i and elements again, here you'll see 27. See how long this is? Okay, so now we got to n cubed. So again, we can just count the number of nested loops. I won't keep going with nested loops, but I do want to like just give a couple more examples. In terms of multiple, if we want to think about like multiple terms, what is the cost of this? Right? This procedure is n. Then we go through this other procedure, which is n squared. So what's the cost? It's n plus n squared, right? n plus n squared. We don't care about lower order terms. So in that case, that's this guy no longer matters. So the cost is gonna be just n squared, right? Because this is gonna dominate this smaller order term. Okay, now I'll take whatever many questions you got. Okay, I have a question. 
What if uh, we put like in the nested for loop before i before print i? Can you put if i in elements? Mm. Now it will be n cube or Correct. still n cube. This is n cubed because really, if i in elements, you know, print i. Well, what does this do? This is really go through, you know, this is kind of a, a hidden loop. This really says for each i in the list of elements, right? This is a third loop. So this is going to be n cubed now. Okay, so we don't have to only see the four. We have to exactly. see what yes. the statement is there. It, that is correct. What's another thing, like, you know, we'll talk about sorting later on, but sorting also, like, kind of involves, I don't want to get into the time complete, but it involves at least n, it's really n log n is the cost of sorting. So if you see something like for each element, or, or for like, maybe you have multi, like a nested list, and for each one of those lists, you need to sort it, right? Well, that's four n lists perform something that costs n log n, right? So you, you have to start to think about, and we'll go, we'll go through some of those. I think I actually have a cheat sheet as to like what the costs of some uh, elements are. And we'll also write out some ourselves, by the way. We'll, we'll write out some Python functions using just a brute force technique, which is what you all did to get into this class, right? We all wrote the slice operation to get in here. Um, so, so yeah, you do have to consider some of the hidden uh, components. Okay, other questions about Big O. Let's review the main things, right? When calculating Big O. Only consider the worst case scenario. Right. Um, to express as a function of the input size, right, or the size of the input, right, n. Three, exclude coefficients and lower order terms, right, because they don't have as much, they don't have enough impact to really care about them, right? They don't really move the dial. Then the other thing we can kind of start to see is how do you calculate big O? Consider nested loops, including, and this is what I mean by nested, right? Including hidden loops. Right, so we can all see that this is n cubed plus n, which reduces down to just n cubed. I have another question. I Go don't ahead. know if it makes sure. sense. Instead of uh, if i in elements, if we are calling a function and function is also doing uh, nested loops. Yes, still, still costs you that amount of money, right? Like, uh, you know, check if in and pass through i, and then this, you know, this, this is still n cubed. Yeah, doesn't matter. When did, well, let me, one thing I didn't talk about, when is, when do you have a problem? <laughs> like, like when is, when is this something to really refactor? When you hit n squared. I'd say like, you don't have to do this right away, but, you know, first solve the problem, but then, you know, is it worth refactoring if you're dealing with like a large data set or try, or at least, you know, spending a minute to see if there's a way to refactor it? Yeah. Right. When, once you hit N squared, if you hit N size N or even size N log N, meaning you have to do some sort of sorting, that's not, that's okay. But once you hit N squared, yeah, that's considered like you might have a problem, right? That, right, you can kind of, and we could see that, right, that 
uh, when we saw that chart, if I have it here, right, that once you hit 10,000, which isn't, we, that hits us at 100 million, right? Once we hit 2,000, an input size of 2,000, that leads to 4 million operations, if we have a procedure that is n squared, right? So that's why you can see n is a problem, Oh, sorry, n squared is a problem. n is really not a problem. Like 10,000 operations is kind of fine sometimes, but like depending on your use case, but probably 100 million is too large, too many. Well, Jeff, um, during what phase of like the development life cycle would you start to prioritize or even start to evaluate time complexity? So I'd say like two different times. Like one is kind of like after you finish writing the function, you know, like you can, you, you go through that process of, okay, make it right, make it work, make it right, meaning refactor, and then make it fast. So like when, do, you know, this comes up in interviews uh, for you, you know, that would be the first time you see it. And when you're coding an interview, I would say first do the inefficient, just obvious brute force way, which we'll talk about more. And then look at, you know, we kind of saw this, just look at following your logic and then look at, you know, just take your logic, break it down into steps, translate that logic into code. Then from there, you can start to think about, okay, it seems like I have a nested loop here. Is there a way to avoid that, right? So there, so that's one. It's just like as you're writing the function or after you complete the first two steps of make it work, make it right, then you can refactor thinking of time complexity. The other time is when your stakeholders start to notice, right? So for example, what we what like we would say uh, is, you know, if it takes longer than a second, right, for a page to load, that could be a good benchmark of, all right, this is taking too long. Um, for Google, right, they are all about this. Like they, you know, and they have the metrics that show how long it t takes. But, you know, like the, for for us, for, for most applications, like a second is kind of like probably a pretty good benchmark of, all right, it's taking more than a second for my page to load. Why is that, right? And start to think through what are the steps, you know, being performed on my in my code uh, and can I reduce a nested loop? Other questions about this? All right. Um, that's not what I wanted to look up. So let's, I'll deploy the readings and 